Hello and welcome to my week 4 update of my deep learning project on eye tracking. This week I covered a number of different things including my two simultaneous approaches. So first of all, uh, we'll talk about some facial landmarking stuff that I made some progress on this week. I will also talk a little bit about um, some object detection of the human eye to sort of do the first phase of the eye tracking. Uh, that was using a, a subset of Open Images version 4 available from Google. And then finally this week I installed a second 1080 Ti to do some uh, simultaneous modeling in my custom build. So let's go and get started. I'll fill you in on the details as we go. So first of all, here's the project. Um, so you can take a look at what it actually involves. So this is a project by seven researchers across three different organizations. And what they do is they take, um, they did a data collection phase of taking a phone and putting dots on the screen and they have a person look at the screen and as they look at each dot, it actually captures a frame of their face. So the idea with this modeling is to take um, the frame as an input, so from an iOS device or maybe eventually a webcam, and actually predict where they're going to look on the screen. These researchers were kind enough to actually map in centimeters how far the, the dot was on the screen from the camera. So we have that as the output. Now, that's the overall project goal. This week uh, I made some progress on, like I said, uh, a couple of different areas. So first of all, um, let me go ahead and give you uh, this link to the project and I'll include this in the link below. Uh, this is the GitHub repository that I'm committing to. Uh, it includes some various writings of uh, different weeks. Like I said, this is week four. I um, also did a visualization that I thought was particularly interesting and this is, you can also find this on Medium. I'll leave that also in the description. And so let's see, let's go ahead and take a look at this facial alignment uh, library that I found. So this is approach number one. So here, uh, what I was able to do, um, I found this project by a PhD student, um, I think at the University of Nottingham in the computer vision department. And essentially he takes uh, facial landmarks of each of the image and maps them just that they uh, appear in 3D. So it's not—it's technically not 3D, it's more of a projection, uh, but the result of the neural network is an output in three-dimensional space. So what I did, first of all, um, I already started this process, um, but I have the frames and essentially I run it through all of the gaze capture data. So available from the, the project eye tracking for everyone, the, uh, the 2.4 million images there. And so I have it run through and generate those. Uh, unfortunately, that took about five days, and it just took very long. Um, did it in batches of 100,000. So this week, I was able to verify the timing, or sorry, the the alignment of that, as well as the timing. So first of all, um, I worked on the timing. So here, let's see, grab this. So I took a sample of 1,000 images, ran it through. So I got the face alignment here, which this is a Python package. Uh, face alignment and it's using PyTorch, uh, set the GPU here and ran it through. So this is the prediction and then did some timing analysis on the results. So here I mapped it from seconds to frames per second and then plotted a histogram. So here's what we're looking at. So if the face is not detected, uh, sorry, yeah, if the face is detected here, it's about six or seven frames a second. So not terribly fast, but not, not terribly slow. Uh, at least for what for what I was doing, and then if there's no face detected, we're looking at 11 to 12 frames per second. So although my my first goal is not to actually achieve real time, I definitely want to keep that in mind because that is sort of the eventual goal to get to, uh, and we'll just have to see how that goes. So second up, uh, I did some started the process of modeling, but I didn't actually get to the the network design, uh, the neural network architecture design. So what I did, so each of these files I had saved out, like I said, in batches of 100,000. So if I take this here, so you can sort of see uh, some of the batches. So each one of these is, contains 100,000 of these frames. And if there was no face found, then it was just an empty NumPy array. Otherwise, it actually has the, the X, Y, and Z coordinates of the facial landmarks, as I just discussed. So thankfully I was able to verify that all these batches uh, appear to have worked. I took a random sampling of from each batch of 100,000 and was able to match them up here 
and just make sure they roughly match the image. It's not a perfect analysis, but it gives me a good subset to, to make sure that I wrote the code right. Um, so I was very thrilled about that, especially after four or five days of work. I also needed to figure out before starting the neural network design uh, what the range of these values are for both x, y, and z. So for x, uh, I plot the distribution here in a simple histogram, and we can see the values range from negative 266 all the way up to 814. Y-axis is pretty similar as well, um, 126 to 802. So the reason for that is so that I can scale the results such that maybe from negative 1 to positive 1, because neural networks tend to operate better on smaller inputs. And then the z-axis uh, was a little bit different. So the min here, negative 374, and the max is 225. Anyway, so that, that's just for scaling purposes. I also thought it would be fun when I was, when I was in here to do a three-dimensional histogram. So taking the two-dimensional data of the x and y points and doing a frequency of where, in that particular area of x and y, how frequently those points appear. So I didn't get to spend too much time on this, uh, but I did actually get something to work here. And let me move this over so you can take a look. So here you can sort of see the outline of the nose projecting forward. It's uh, kind of interesting. So right here, you sort of see that. And just for distribution, nothing, nothing too crazy, but at least gives me an idea. So most of my time this week was actually focused uh, not on this. I sort of got to this um, at the end of the week to sort of take a look at it. Didn't get a chance, like I said, to, to start the neural network modeling, but um, hope to start that next week. Um, so instead, I spent some time, uh, first of all, doing some upgrades for my custom build so that I can have multiple models running, and then also spent some time doing the object detection of the human eye as a secondary approach. So the 1080 value, you can see here in the case, the second uh, line of, of labels there. And uh, it was supposed to be a real, real breeze to set up. It, it took a little while and uh, was, was not quite that simple. Everything from churning fans to um, the bridge from my motherboard for the, the single, uh, the, the SLI was actually bending, which is not a good idea. So I actually just got the NVIDIA SLI bridge today and installed it, and it seems to be working pretty well. So I'm very excited about that. So that should make it very easy to, to actually train multiple models. As you get into this, uh, this next section, I'll explain how that was particularly useful. So over here, I'll take a look at this, this next notebook that I put together. So this is, um, as I mentioned, an open images uh, data set here. So if I open this up, so this is a subset of Open Images version 4 that's uh, put together by Google. And so it's a, Open Images itself is a database of 9 million images. And uh, let's see, so the subset is 1.9 million images, covers 600 different classes. Thankfully, one of those 600 classes is actually the human eye. And so I could run with that and get that to, uh, to use that for prediction purposes. So here's the data set. Um, each one of these is about 60 gigs. And we can see if I move back over here to, uh, sorry, it's open images here. So here are the different uh, folders, and this is different meta information. So if we go back to this notebook, we can see different things about this. Um, so this is the annotation, the label box. So I have uh, 36,000 different annotations I can draw from that are all just the label human eye. Now that doesn't mean that there's that many um, photos, um, but that should be the labels themselves, I believe. So here's what what the data set looks like for at least the meta information. So you have the image ID, which directly maps to a particular train folder and you know appending.jpg, and then you have the bounding boxes. See your x min, x max, y min, y max. Now, I'm using a version of YOLO version 3 that has been ported to Keros. And the reason for that is that's sort of the focus of the class. But additionally, if I want to add more layers and do some training uh, to extend the output, I can do that directly in Keros and not have to worry about the, the transition of that. So to try to take you know, the minimum route possible to getting a result, I mapped it directly to the format that they're expecting. And of course, before that, I wanted to make sure that I have the coordinate system right. It is the top left, um, I think, is, is what it usually is with Python. Um, but either way, it matches up here. So you can see the red box in each one of these images. There, there of course, can be multiple. And I'm just displaying a, a random sample of uh, the rectangle in each one of these. 
So I had to map this to a big uh, text file and with this kind of format. So the image path and then with white space delimited, uh, the boxes and the classes of the, the different human eye uh, bounding boxes. So here this is your, your X-min, your X-max, your Y-min, your Y-max, and then your class value. Since I'm only producing human eye as one class, I'm not doing multiple class predictions. I can just say zero for all of those. Uh, so that took a while, so I have that commented out. So when I run it again, it doesn't actually uh, do that. It takes about seven, eight minutes on my computer. So here I also set up the, uh, the GPU options. For this particular one, I'm saying to select the second GPU and only use 90% of the memory. Uh, TensorFlow has a habit of immediately taking up like 95% of your GPU memory, uh, even if it's not actually doing anything. It's sort of uh, eager loading it such that it can take advantage of that. So I tried a, a, multiple different versions of each of these models to sort of see what would work best and sort of get some practice training these, um, uh, retraining an existing set of YOLO weights um, to human eye detection. Um, so some of them I used a, a subset, some of them I tweaked the learning rate, um, and this, the example uh, from the project of Keros YOLO 3 actually has two, two sections of sort of having the top three layers being trainable. So you train on that for, I think it's either 50 or 100 epochs, and then after that unfreezing all of them, making all the layers trainable which obviously takes a long time to actually run that in memory, or takes up a lot of memory, and then doing a fine-tuning section where the learning rate is much lower. So here, uh, I won't go through all of this, but essentially, you know, the, it's just sort of this, running through the epochs and, and trying that out. I didn't run it uh, the whole duration for all of them. In fact, I didn't actually finish the, the entire fine-tuning on any of them. It, it took a long time. The longest model that I trained was about 15 hours. And like I said, because I was installing the 1080 Ti, I had some additional work in the beginning of the week before I could even start extra models. I also experienced some fun things that um, the GPU would get used up on, on my Linux machine and then just everything freezes and you gotta restart and it can be frustrating. Um, so, let's see here. So I found this wonderful um, tool, TensorBoard, that I mentioned before, very, very useful. Um, it's, it's directly on the TensorFlow website. It's not, not an important discovery. Um, it's, a, it's kind of a default way of handling all of these accuracy metrics. So here's what I have. So these are some measurements. So if I zoom in here, let's, let's take a look at this. Okay, so what you're seeing here, so my orange line here is the, the version 1 and that's sort of my baseline. I didn't really tweak anything from the, the sample from Keras YOLO. And then the blue one was, the only variation was I trained it on the entire set. I think the first set I may have done, I don't know, 10,000 or 5,000 images. And then for the second one, I just ran it on all of it to see what, what would sort of happen with that. Then once I finally got the GPU installed, I ran two models simultaneously. Um, so this is version three and version four. And you see those are both run on 12,000 images and using the Atom Optimizer with two different learning, well, okay, so the first one, I changed the learning rate from <clears throat> uh, 0 0.001 to 0.01. And then the third one that I changed, I, I left the learning rate the same, but even in the, the beginning training phases, unfroze 10 of the layers just to see what, what would sort of happen there. So as you can see clearly here, the, the light blue is what I stuck with because um, it, it was having much better performance. The darker blue, the only difference between that and the baseline was that I was training on all of the images. So I actually went, I stopped it for after, you know, whatever, it's two, two hours and 15 minutes. I just actually tweaked some parameters to start to get an understanding of how things were working. So the blue one, I was very happy. Um, it was coming down here. It was not making much progress for maybe 10 hours, you know, not, you know, not making a whole lot of progress. And then this big dip here is going to be as soon as the fine tuning started. So like I said, that's when all of the layers were unfrozen, made those trainable, uh, lowered the learning rate so that they only get tweaked, but so that then you can do the back propagation through all of the layers. And of course we can see this matched on the validation, um, so there's not a terrible mismatch here. We can add a little bit of smoothing uh, to sort of even that out. 
Um, I stopped here. I actually did a presentation at work on some of the stuff, and um, there's it was sort of a spike here. But I'll go back and actually run on the full data set and do some some more tweaking in the coming week. But this was I was I was pretty excited about getting something that actually um, was more than useless. So <laughs> that, was, that was pretty exciting. Um, <clears throat> Now I was a little bit worried when I, I actually tested, I forget which model version, but one of these I tested on images and it was it was terrible, like it wasn't even close. So I'm, I'm still just sort of jumping into this and, and learning how to tweak the parameters. Um, but I did try it on the latest model here, I'm not sure which version of this it is right now. Um, but essentially the loss is, is much lower. Um, also, just sort of as a, a side curiosity here, this red line is where I changed the learning rate to be particularly low. Um, and actually, sorry, that was the version 3 where I changed the learning, learning rate. So it spikes down way below these other ones when it starts, but it, it just kind of fizzles out here and doesn't actually um, lower your loss. So, um, and obviously, looking at these graphs and stuff, these, the loss function lowers better and that means you have more accuracy. I haven't gone into the test set yet to even do some metrics because I'm just at the validation stage at this point. And because I'm running through you know, a large amount of images, it just takes a while to, to train. So here's the, the test that I did of this information. So I loaded up uh, the model here that I was going to look at and then ran it on the image. So you can see it's not fantastic. I was able to actually do a live demo um, <clears throat> just from my webcam and seeing what it would recognize, try taking off my glasses, putting them on, and uh, just sort of seeing, just to sort of a, a RAM test and see how efficient it was. I think it ran about 15 frames a second, but I think part of that was due to the fact that I was uh, converting from a pill image to um, a CV2, oh sorry, CV2 image, OpenCV to a pill image, and that was actually taking up some of the processing power for each frame. Now also my uh, software engineering side was, was killing me for being able to not repeat some of the code in each of these notebooks. So I've extracted some of the functionality to a shared file here. Um, so the capture data frame, uh, this memoirs here is a Python decorator that allows you to keep calling the function. It doesn't actually, it, it caches the results. Uh, likewise for open images, extracted some of this stuff. Uh, let's go here. Yep, and so all of these are memoirs, so I can just pass it in there, and it's based on the parameters too. So it will automatically filter based on the eye label, but if I ever want to do anything else with it, that's I can mess around with that. And if, if there are other people out there that want to take advantage of this, these are some super generic functions that make it really easy to read in the data frame, because it took a while to understand the open images format and make sure I had the images matched up with, or the, the image IDs matched up with the image path. Um, but got all of that solved. So that's pretty much it for this week, I, as I mentioned. So next week I'm going to be focusing on the working on the facial line of stuff and then continuing to work on the models for YOLO and getting used to uh, two graphics cards and how to deal with those, how much memory to allocate and whether I should run it on one and you know, running a big monitor on it can, can make a big difference um, as far as um, you know running everything simultaneously. So. Anyways, thanks for, for watching, and if you have any comments, uh, questions, uh, tooling, uh, questions about setup, whatever, whatever you want to share, uh, please do so, and I will do my best to get back with you. Thanks so much for watching.